Do you want to, Maria, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. We would like to welcome you to the second webinar of the Clinician Engineer Summer School. For those who, of you who do not know about us, we are an international hub that works on bridging the gap between medicine and engineering. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Josh Kaye, an Australian doctor and software developer. Josh has built and launched various mobile apps and clinical decision aids, which are in use in some of Australia's largest hospitals. Most recently, he has written a book on coding for doctors. Feel free to post questions throughout the talk, and Josh will then answer as many as possible, time permitting at the end. Over to you, Josh. Thanks very much for the introduction, Maria, and thank you very much again for having me, um, Chloe, Maria, and Faisal, and the rest of the team at um, uh, the Clinician Engineer, Clinician Engineer Help. I'm really excited to be here for our second session on an introduction to programming for doctors and medical students. Um, what, um, you know, we're going to basically cover most of the stuff that we covered last week. Um, and this week I want a lot more programming and a lot less kind of um, preambling about why you should learn to code and, and what all that sort of stuff. I suspect most of the people in the audience have already been convinced that um, there's at least some um, uh, utility in learning to code. So um, I think we should just sort of dive right in. Um, all right, so let's let's talk a little bit about um, just a question at the end of last session and then we'll recap the programming that we did last week and then um, and then we'll add some new stuff on as well um, and then if we have time at the end um, it's not directly related but I thought I'd do a little um, teachable machine demonstration I've got some cutlery here which we're going to use to um, train a bit of a machine learning model at the end it's not directly related to the rest of the class I just thought most people in the audience would find it fairly interesting um, all right so let's um, Get cracking. Um, so I just, yeah, this is the same slide from last week or oh, last time. Um, you know, I'm a medical doctor. I have strong interest in health technology and innovation. Um, I've also worked as a software developer um, and I've built uh, various apps, um, kind of like Maria mentioned, including a blood transfusion app and a couple of other bits and pieces. Um, and I've also um, I completed a short internship at an um, Israeli medical technology company called HealthyDio.io. Um, all right, so um, just in terms of summarising what we spoke about last week, um, we spoke about reasons why you might learn to code, and I divided them into personal and societal reasons. So personally, you know, it's fun, you can earn money, um, you can automate boring things. Um, in terms of societal reasons, I think we need efficient healthcare solutions that um, are going to scale to provide accessible and affordable health services to the whole country. And um, technology is one of the ways that we can do that. Um, another way that society will benefit is um, having clinicians who are te um, technologically savvy, who are able to evaluate, um, implement and maintain fairly um, advanced technology systems. So, you know, AI and that kind of stuff over the next few decades as that starts to come into practice. I think we need doctors who understand both the patient care side and the technology side. And there are other reasons, but I'm not gonna go into them now. Um, and we spoke about some things that you can do with programming. So you can make websites, you can make mobile apps, you can make research tools, you can make scripts that automate menial tasks. An example that we gave last week was uh, using, um, uh, a script to look in your inbox for when your boss emails you your roster and then automatically taking the roster, which is typically in an Excel spreadsheet, or at least it is for me anyway, um, and then putting that the information in that Excel spreadsheet straight into your Google Calendar without you having to do anything. Um, other stuff you can do include building medical education tools, stuff like that. Um, we spoke a bit about not finding the best programming language, um, just gets cracking and a little bit of the, the patterns, of, in fact, almost all of the patterns that we spoke about last week, you know, if statements, echo statements, print statements, all that stuff, um, do generally transfer between languages. So don't um, allow the analysis paralysis to stop you from just getting started on something. Um, it's certainly better than nothing. Um, and you don't need to become an expert programmer to benefit enormously from learning to code. Um, bit of a common misconception, people tell me they don't have time, they don't, you know, whatever. Um, and if you don't have time, you know, that's okay. You don't have to, I'm not saying you have to, um, but I do think there are massive opportunities for um, healthcare workers in general who learn to code. And there certainly, will, and this will only be increasing over the next um, decade or so. Um, 
so a bit of new material now. We're just going to talk briefly about like philosophy of how to learn to code and how to like actually approach it from a um, uh, an in principle point of view. Uh, and the first thing to note is, you know, um, um, expect to be challenged. I think most people um, uh, agree, you know, are aware of this point that it's it's not easy to learn to code. Um, but it's nowhere near as hard as it looks from the outside, in my opinion. And I, that's part of the, um, one of the themes I want to communicate in this talk is that you can do it um, and you can get started from scratch. Um, and it it's, doesn't have to be, um, you know, this very difficult, inaccessible thing that um, it sort of feels like for a lot of people from the outside. Um, you know, expect to be frustrated. Um, expect to have periods of time where you're not make, you feel like you're not making much progress. Um, it's very, very common for software web developers for all levels to spend a lot of time sort of um, you know, hitting your head up against a stone wall about something that you, a problem that you don't know how to fix. Um, and so sort of furiously Googling things and looking very deep into um, uh, various websites for solutions is actually one of the, the core skills I think that you need as a software developer. It's not like, um, you know, a, a medical school exam where you can... Um, you know, hope to um, store all the information up in your head um, or, or a huge amounts of it anyway. Um, you've always got an open book when you're writing computer programs. You've always got the, um, Google. You've always got, you know, documentation for certain languages. And so you expect to have to rifle through that stuff to get the information that you need. Um, expect to need help, you know, find a mentor. Um, I think having a mentor can help um, fix a lot of those problems fairly quickly at the start and trying to do it all on your your own is probably not time efficient, especially for a doctor or a med student. Um, I think you should mingle with developers who are more experienced than you. So, you know, follow them on Twitter, follow them on YouTube, look at their projects on GitHub um, and just um, being in the same environment they are. So, you know, going to um, uh, talks, going to meetups, that kind of stuff, all a really good way to sort of immerse yourself in the ecosystem and um, sort of soak knowledge up. Um, this is sort of what I was talking about before. Don't aim to memorize stuff as you would perhaps for a med school exam or a university exam. Um, it's actually more than enough just to conceptually understand what you're trying to do with programming. When it comes time to actually um, build something, if you conceptually understand, you can always look up the um, minutiae or the specifics. Um, and this is, this is something that I did to start with. I timetabled some programming time. So at first it was around an hour a week. Um, now I try to get up an hour or two every day before work to program, but that's, that's, that is not the amount of, you don't have to dedicate that much time to, to make some benefit. I just do that because I've, you know, um, got a fairly extensive like list of projects and stuff that I work on, but you wouldn't certainly wouldn't have to do that to start with. And you certainly wouldn't have to do that at any time if you didn't want to. That's something that I just choose to do. Um, start small, you know, don't go too ambitious on the projects. Um, Having said that, you know, I defend everyone's right to tackle whatever they want to tackle. But I actually think by doing incrementally um, increasing difficulty of projects is a really good way to, um, one, feel like you're making progress um, and two, um, keep your motivation going. You know, if you actually ship and publish things, that's a really good source of motivation for you to um, continue to learn. Um, and yeah, here's another point, like choose a language that's right for you. Um, obviously that's a little bit at odds with what I was saying before about, you know, just get started. Um, but if you have very clearly want to, um, you know, get into making mobile apps or whatever, make sure you're using a technology that facilitates that. And in my last talk, I spoke about some of my favorite languages and, um, my recommendations about what you should learn for what situation. If you're confused about that, feel free to send me a message and we can talk about your options. Um, and copy other people, copy other experienced developers. Um, build smaller versions of projects that they've made, fork their projects, so go onto GitHub, copy them, you know, um, extend them in your own way. That's a, a really good way to learn as well. Um, and then this is probably the last thing I'll mention on this topic. I really, I don't actually think um, tutorials are the way that you become a really a excellent developer. I think they're a good way to quote unquote find your feet. Um, and then I think as soon as you feel able to make the most basic level of project, I actually think you should abandon tutorials. Um, and yes, I'm aware of the um, irony in this, that we're gonna do some tutorials today and that I've written a book all about 
programming tutorials, um, but it kind of goes back to what I was saying before about, um, uh, you know, not, um, uh, that, that the real learning is coming from um, building your own projects, furiously, you know, Googling problems that, you know, um, you, you don't have a solution to sitting in front of you. That kind of problem solving, that creating, that's the real skill. The, 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 um, you don't really develop that skill by kind of regurgitating a, um, a series of steps that you get from a recipe like you would in your tutorial. I think it's good for a foundational level of understanding, but then to really get to the next level, you need to be creating your own projects and um, approaching a problem that you haven't quite seen before and going through practice of solving um, those problems is how you become a good programmer. Um, I have I had talked more about this at length in a blog post um, about how to learn to code and I have a QR code here. So I don't know if you guys are on phones or laptops, but if you're on your um, or, or computers, if you're on a computer, you can just take your camera out and scan that QR code and that'll take you to that blog post if you're interested. Um, it's also free to learn to code. Lots of people are asking me about free coding resources. The number one resource that I recommend is actually YouTube. I put some of my favorite YouTubers there who are you know, more or less active nowadays. Um, but finding someone who's in your niche is quite important too. So depending on whatever technology you're working on, um, uh, find someone that you kind of like. And um, there's so much as a wealth of free information out there. Academy has awesome like interactive tutorial thing. Coding Academy is also awesome. They're probably one of the world's, you know, they're one of the world leading educators in free programming tutorials and stuff. Um, Treehouse is another one. There's this Harvard CS um, computer science course. There's also a Stanford science course. Both free, would you believe it? Um, they're quite um, uh, technical. They're quite um, deep in terms of their. Um, uh, in their theoretical approach to programming, um, but they're free and they're from a premier institution and they're really high quality. So um, check any of those out if you're strapped for cash. I'm also writing a book about it. Shameless plug my own stuff. There's a QR code here um, where you can, again, zap it and leave your email if you want to know when it, about it when it's released. Um, it's going to be free in low and middle income countries. So there is a fee associated with it, um, but I don't recommend that you Having just said that, that programming is free, I don't recommend that you buy this with your last, you know, 20 pennies or whatever. Um, this is, I don't really do this for the money, um, but, uh, um, you know, if, if this is the right book for you, then buy it. Otherwise, I'm happy to give you advice and happy to point you in the right direction um, anyway, because learning to code is free and it should be free. That's my, my personal opinion. Uh, all right, let's talk about... Um, uh, some of the programming that we spoke about last week. That's enough um, uh, chatting. Let's um, switch up this screen sharing situation. Um, right. um. <clears throat> cool. So there we go. We've got the new screen up. Um, so I've actually got my webcam set up on the left here and I've got a screen directly in front of me. So I'm going to be looking at the screen so don't get too confused by that. Um, so last week we spoke about um, the absolute basics of programming. I'm quickly going to go over them again. Um, so this is a script that I've set up called script.php and this is a terminal window and the terminal window lets me execute programs quickly. I can open the terminal window by hitting command and shift on my Mac and typing terminal and hitting enter. I'm not going to do that today because I've already got one set up. Um, um, and I, I guess the other thing to note before we, we dive into this is that there is a little bit of setting uh, um, setup required to um, do the things that I'm about to do. You have to set up your developer environment. Um, but um, perhaps in a future session, we'll cover how to actually set it up. Today, we're just going to do some more theory like we did last time. So the, um, when I run this, pro, as you can see, I've written the word uh, the number 26 in here. And if I run the program at the moment by typing PHP, script.php, um, you can see that there's no real output. There's no, uh, the program hasn't outputted anything, hasn't yielded anything. If I want the program to yield something, I have to use this keyword echo, which sends output into the terminal window. So if I run it again, you can see that I've got this output 26. Um, and just like we did last week, I um, don't necessarily need to worry about this too much. This is, I'm just also going to echo out a new line character. 
so that when I run the script, you can see our output is on a new line um, to this, this um, kind of um, thing that sits here by default in the terminal window, okay? Um, all right, so um, we spoke about, you know, echoing numbers last week like this or integers. Um, we can also echo collections of uh, new numeric characters, so letters and numbers that are known as strings. So this is a string, and you can identify it by the double quotation marks on either side. Alternatively, you can actually use single quotation marks as well. It doesn't really matter, but this is a string. It's a collection of alphanumeric characters. That's all you really, really need to know now. Um, and if I, if I um, echo this um, string, you can see that it pops up in the, uh, in the output window. All right. Um, next thing that we spoke about was variables. So variables are vessels of um, are vessels that let us store information. And in this language, PHP, a variable is easily identified by a dollar sign followed by some name. I can name the variable anything I want, and I can store information inside it. So in this case, um, I'm going to use um, a variable called name. Um, and any time we see a single equals sign, what that means is that we are assigning a value to a, to a variable. So in this case, it's using a single equal sign. So we're setting the value of name to be, we're going to use the same example we used last week, which was Socrates. So um, we've taken the string Socrates and we've stored it inside the variable called name. And any time after this point, we can use, um, reuse the variable. And when we run the script now, we get the output of Socrates. Okay. Um, now something we um, didn't speak about very clearly last week, um, it's probably important to mention, is um, uh, for now, we'll just assume that programs run from left to right and um, linearly line by line. Um, so what I mean by that is, let's see what happens if I try to use, like if I try to echo the variable name before I've set any values in it. So remembering that the program leads linearly down like this. If I try to echo the variable name before I have stored, before I've set anything inside the variable, let's see what happens. Notice that I'm getting an error here that's telling me that there's an undefined variable name on line two. So obviously we can't echo the variable. We can't yield that as an output before there's anything inside it. The interpreter doesn't like that. It's an error. So the, the reason I did this demonstration is to demonstrate that the program is read proceed. The, the um, interpreter reads the, the program from left to right um, and then line by line in a very, very procedural way. Um, there are actually some exceptions to that, but for now we're just going to leave it. We're going to leave it as 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 is. Um, all right, so if we, we fix it all up and clear it, um, we can run the script again. We also learned that we can combine different expressions together using concatenation or a full stop. So the example we used last week was Socrates and his age. Um, and then we can do things like, um, so we're using a string here, his name is, and we put this dot in, his name is name. His age is and his is age is old. Awesome. So I've got a string concatenated onto a variable, which is concatenated onto another string and concatenated onto another variable, etc. And that helps us merge those expressions together so that with one echo statement, I can send out, we get the whole sentence. His name is Socrates and he's, he's 2,490 years old. Pretty cool. Um, all right, what else have I got? So we can also do some arithmetic. So if we come back here and we go, you know, we've got, um, let's create a new variable and we're going to set, remember, anytime we see a C single equal sign, it means we're assigning a value to a variable. So we're going to set the variable, variable new age, and I'm going to set that to age plus 10. So if I echo new age now, We get 2500 because we've um, new age is equal to 2490 plus 10. So that's how we add. 
We can also subtract using a minus sign. We run that now, we get 2,480, because it's 2,490 minus 10. We learned that we can multiply using an asterisk, giving us 24,900. And we learned that we can divide using a forward slash, a little bit unusual, but it's a forward slash. That's how we, how we divide um, typically in programming languages. And you can see we get 249, which is 2,090 divided by 10. Um, and then we, we started building on this a little bit. We started building on the arithmetic and we, we learned that we could um, uh, calculate someone's BMI um, in the following way. So we use this example, which was height of 194, I think, and then a weight um, of 94. And then we um, add a new variable called BMI and we set it to, um, uh, I always get this the wrong way, it's weight over height times height. So a little bit more of a complex arithmetic expression. And then if we echo BMI now, um, we can see we get a BMI of 27.17. So that was the example that we'd set up last week. And this is the most trivial type of um, BMI calculator that you can create. Um, we then spoke about if statements. So an if statement is the most basic uh, um, uh, decision-making pattern or, or um, fork in our code that we can use, that we can, that can, we can, that we can use it will allows us to set up um, blocks of code that will only run under certain conditions. Um, as an example, last week we used this, um, this concept of age limiting our, uh, our access to our BMI calculator. So um, we started with an, um, an age of 26 and then we set up an if statement. We said, we, um, we set up an if statement like this and recall that this is the general definition, this is the general structure of an if statement. So we have the word if, we have a set of round brackets, and then we have a code block in curly brackets. And the way an if statement works is inside the, the circular brackets, you put some expression. And if that expression evaluates to true, then this code block will run. If, however, this expression evaluates to false, then this code block will be skipped. Let's give you an example. So the expression I'm gonna put in here is age less than 18. Um, and I'll put in here echo, um, don't use a BMI calculator. Too young. Okay. Now at the moment, um, age is 26. So the expression age is less than 18 is gonna be false. Therefore, this code block will be skipped. So let's run it. And you can see that we got the same output that we did last time. Putting this echo statement in didn't do anything. If, however, I change my age to 16, um, this expression, age is less than 18, is now gonna be true. Therefore, because it's true, this code block will run. Let's have a look. So you can see that um, the block is run, it's echoed that statement. Um, and also note that we've still got the, out, the BMI output because this code block ran. And then as we know, the program which proceeds linearly down um, the lines, um, the interpreter reads the program line by line. It read this if statement, found that the, this expression was true and therefore ran the code block. And then it continued to the next line and calculated the BMI and then it echoed the BMI. If we don't want this to happen, if we don't want the program to continue after using the if statement, we can actually use what's called an else statement. So it's an, um, an else statement is used in, um, in cahoots with an if statement. And this else statement governs another code block that will run in the case that this expression is false. So I'll just go back from the top. If this expression is true, then this code block will run and this code block will be skipped. If this expression is false, then this code block will be skipped and this code block will be run. So if I grab these, these um, bits here and I put them inside the code block and I run it here. Um, I'll 
here, just for clarity. Um, and right now, note that we haven't got the BMI on the end here. It's just told us to use a BMI calculator because we're too young. If I put my age back, uh, rerun, now it calculates our BMI as usual. All right. Now, this is all well and good, um, except um, it's not very fun just writing a program where the programmer themselves has to put in all the, um, the variables. It's, it's just not that useful. Um, the way real programs work is by um, providing some way for the user to put in values into the program and or to put in um, uh, uh, expressions or, or values. Um, and the way that um, programmers allow users to do this is through what's called a user interface. So a, um, a system that using the mouse and keyboard allows you to put expressions into a computer program. So we're going to make a very simple um, uh, user interface. I'm going to use HTML to do it. Um, so let me just get up our blank so I've, um, what do they call it? Uh, um, we're, going to, we're going to create a new HTML page. So let's, um, let's just save it. And this file, I'm going to end it in HTML. So we're going to have to learn the absolute basics of HTML to um, get this to work. So I've got a, a brand new blank page, all right? And so, we're now not in PHP land and, and note that the PHP file here is opened by this funny little tag and closed by this funny little tag. Uh, in this instance, I'm not gonna use those tags. So we're not in the PHP context anymore. We're in a HTML context, all right? And the HTML is like the building block of the internet. They are basically these bricks that you put together to make complex web pages. We're gonna make a very, very simple web page now. The basic building block of the HTML world is what is known as a HTML element. Um, and here's an example of an element. This is a, what's called a H1 element or a heading element. Um, and the general structure of an element is to have an opening tag that looks like this, and then a closing tag that looks like this with this forward slash in here. And then the contents of the tag goes in between. So here I'm gonna put BMI calculator as our heading, okay? If I save that and refresh this page now, um, let's just set up our page to be, so I can see both at once. All right, so we can see that I've got a heading of BMI calculator. Now there is actually um, dozens, if not hundreds of different HTML element types that you can learn. I'll quickly touch on some now. So there's H2 as well, which is a slightly smaller heading. So we're going Great one now. So remember, I've got my H2 opening tag and my H2 closing tag. If we run this now, you can see we've got a slightly smaller heading. I can also put um, tags inside uh, elements inside elements. So now I'm going to use an I tag, which stands for italic. I'm going to make wrap it around this weight thing. So I've got an opening I tag and a closing I tag. Um, and I run this, and you can see that the word weight is now in italics. Well, let's get rid of that because that's ugly. Um, now, almost all elements, uh, almost all HTML elements have a opening and a closing tag. However, there are some exceptions. One of those exceptions is what's known as an input. So I just literally just put the word input here. And if I refresh the page now, you can see that I've got this little text box that will let me enter stuff in. So that's, what, that's an input an input element and we're going to use input to help us set up some heights and weights. So um, let's put um, this here, so heights. And you can see that we've got a nice little label now with an input because I've got a nice little label and an input. Um, and just for simplicity's sake, what I'm going to do now is actually use another element, another element that has a just, just an opening tag and no closing tag. This isn't actually good practice, but I'll, I'll, I'll explain it a bit later on, perhaps in a future, se future session. This, this element just creates a new line. So it jumps down to the next line and then it lets us, I'm gonna do the same thing for weight. Okay. And so now I've got height and weight. I've got these beautiful little inputs here, which is looking pretty good. So, you know, this is what we're aiming for. So the height was 187 and the weight was 94. But now I don't really have a way to submit the um, the information anywhere. I can't send the information in the input anyway. So what we're going to create 
is a button. So there's my button opening tag, and my, my button closing tag, and then some contents. Contents. So we'll use calculate, um, and we're actually going to be naughty and use another line break here, another break. Um, let's space this out a little bit so you can, maybe it's a bit easier to understand. Okay? Um, so we've now got a calculate button, um, but if I click it, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't send it anywhere. Even if I enter the values in, it doesn't go anywhere. So we need some way to get the information from this page.html and send it to our script over here. We want it to run in our script. So how do we do that? The way that we do that is we use a special type of element known as a form. And so as we know, the general structure of a form uh, of any element is to have an opening and a closing tag. Um, and what a form is, you can't actually see a form, but what it is, it's kind of like an envelope, an envelope that you put an address on um, and you, um, you put an address on and then you put things inside the envelope and you send it somewhere else. So in this case, um, the destination that we're going to send it to is script.php. That's our destination. That's our other file that has all this information in it, this, this logic in it. So if I create a, a form here, I'm going to create an, open, an opening form tag. Um, and then I want the form to wrap around all of the other contents of our web page, all of our inputs and our button. Okay, so I'm going to um, indent them all and then put another form, uh, a closing form tag down the end. Okay, so we've got an opening form tag down here and a closing form tag here so that all of the contents um, of our, all of the important contents of our web page are inside our form. Okay, now remember that a form is like it envelope and an envelope needs an address and the way that we set the address on the envelope is we say action equals script.php so action is basically an address so our address is script.php um, and then we're going to put a space in here and then we're going to use a method it's not really that important to understand this whole method thing um, the analogy that I'm going to use is that this is a way that we can define a type of mail. So in the same way that there is overnight shipping or snail mail or different types of mail that you can use, there's all different types of mail that you can use in um, when you're making these forms as well. But now we're just gonna use the post mail. Um, so we've set up an envelope, we've got an address of script.php and we have a, a post um, mail, a, a post type of mail. Um, and now let's let's see what happens if we um, if we run our um, let's refresh this page now. Let's see what happens if we run the um, run the page like this. Um, you can see that it's sent to our um, it has gone to our script.php page. Um, although I, I've, I think I've probably confused things a little bit here. Let's put in. Um, Let's put in some really bad values. Let's put in a height of, you know, three meters um, and a weight of 10 kilograms and hit to calculate. So in, in this instance, we'd expect them to have a really, really low BMI because they're, they're three meters tall, but they only weigh 10 kilos. But note that it's still giving us the output of 27, um, the BMI of 27, like we did at the beginning. The reason for that is that our script the values that we're using for, um, for height and weight are fixed. Like we've just set them to be a, a solid value here. What we actually want to do um, is set them to um, a value that um, is passed in on the envelope when it gets sent to them, the post envelope. The way that we do that is we use a special variable called underscore post um, and then, oh, not name, let's go height. So um, inside the, the post envelope, look for the value called height. And so um, set the value of height to um, something that's in the post envelope and has a name of height. All right. And then in weight, we're going to set the value of weight to something that's in the post envelope with a name of weight. Okay. So let's go back to our little post envelope here. We need to put a 
name. So we're going to put a name of height. And here we're going to put a name of weight. All right. And so now when I run the program, we've set up this envelope with two, two values inside it. Um, a height value and a weight value. That is going to get sent to script.php. Okay. At the top of our script here, we're setting the value of height in, P in the PHP context. We're setting the value of height. Remember, anytime we see a single equal sign, we're setting a value. We're setting the value of height to something that's in the post envelope with a name of height. So remember, we've got post envelope, name of height. Here we've got post envelope, name of height. Um, and we did do the same thing for hot, for weight. So we've got a post envelope with a name of weight, post envelope, name of weight. And then the rest of the program runs as it did previously. So let's go back and um, use another example now. So we're going to use a height of two meters and a weight of 100 kilos. And we run it. Um, oh, I have to refresh this. <clears throat> We get a flat BMI of 25, which is right. Um, let's um, just to prove it for something else, you know, 1.5 and a weight of 80. And we get a BMI of 35. So you can see that this way we've created a very simple user interface, which lets someone with no um, informa uh, knowledge about programming input values into our um, into our program. So this is a Using this kind of this, these um, techniques, you can actually make a really powerful programs that do um, all sorts of different things. Um, all right, so we, in summary, we've learned about variables, if statements, um, uh, strings, um, uh, concatenation, arithmetic, um, uh, else statements. So that's all the PHP that we've covered. So with all of those tools, you can already do some pretty cool stuff. Um, and then we started learning about user interfaces and um, HTML, which is um, the, the building block language of the internet. The basic building block, um, the basic brick that we use for HTML is the HTML element. Um, there are lots and lots of different types of elements. You don't need to memorize them all now, um, but um, some of the ones that we used were the, um, the H1, the heading tag, um, the H2, which is like a smaller heading, um, you input tag, um, and a button tag, and a form tag to build up this this um, this ba very basic looking user interface. Um, what I might do just for the last five minutes um, is talk a little bit about how CSS fits into HTML. So HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language. So a markup language is one that was really about um, the decoration and structure of a web page. So um, uh, that's what HTML does. It lets you decorate and provide structure to web pages. Whereas something like PHP is a logical programming language. So that has your if statements, your echo statements, um, your else statements, and there's lots more statements as well that we might cover in a future session. Um, uh, and then, so you've got your, your HTML, your PHP for logic, and then you've got CSS, which stands for creative style sheets. So the simplest way to think about CSS is that it's a basically a way to provide color and organizing and decorating a web page in a bit more of a rich way than HTML can. We're going to do a very, very basic um, introduction to some styling now. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm just wrapping all of our um, elements uh, inside a body tag. And the body tag is a um, standard tag that's on every web page, um, regardless of whether you include it in your document or not. The reason that I've included it in this document is so that I can apply some styles or some, some colors and, and um, arrangements to, the, to our page a little bit. Um, so here I'm going to use a style for a background color of gray. If I refresh this page now, you can see that our, the background of our page is now gray. Um, and I hope to, I, I will re-explain this in a future session. I'm just trying to, um, at a high level, show how those pieces fit together. So the HTML, which is our elements, which are our basic building blocks, 
our PHP, which is our logic, our if statements, our echo statements, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then our CSS, which is a special kind of um, language, I guess, that helps you decorate your pages, really. Um, so I've set the background to gray. Um, don't worry too much about what I'm doing now. I'm just making a few little structural changes to our page. That's to expect to show at a high level how this all works. So here I'm using a div element, which stands for a logical division of a web page. Um, and I'm going to set this thing, to, I'm going to give this thing a background color of white. Um, so we've got this now. Um, I'm going to give it a width of 500 pixels. Center it. Um, and then let's give it a little bit of padding. So I'm, I've just given it some padding, so there should be some space inside this white box when I refresh it, which there is now. Um, and look, I could keep going, but I won't. Um, maybe I'll just put some margin top on. Some space at the top of the web page here. Um, and so, and, and so you can see how, um, you know, um, in just a couple of minutes, we can make a still fairly ugly, but um, fairly convincing interface for a BMI calculator that you might see on a web page. We're using a HTML building blocks for the structure of the page, PHP for the logic and the decision making and the arithmetic and all that sort of stuff, like we did here, and then the um, CSS for the for the colouring and the, how the pages are arranged and stuff like that. Um, all right, I'm conscious that we've been going for um, 40 or 45 minutes almost. Um, so now might be a good time to go to some Q and A if people have questions about any of this kind of stuff, um, and um, and then we can we can go from there. So I welcome you guys to pop any questions in and, and um, let's go. All right. Thank you, Josh, for such an informative session and for uh, motivating us to uh, get involved into, co in, into coding. And so have, we have a few questions for you in the chat if you want to take a look. Yeah, absolutely. So I can see a question here from, is it Ree Fernandez who asked the question a while ago. Sorry, I've, I've not done what I promised to do, which was read the chat as I was going. I think I'm getting very distracted by um, what I'm talking about. And the question is, what was the function of the red dots on line six when we did the my name is blank and my age is blank? Yeah, so that's, um, yeah, I'm just gonna, let's delete this for now. And that's a, that's a great question, really. let's talk about that. So the example he's talking about is um, when we were, we were talking about this, so we had an age and we had a name. Or he or she, sorry, me. I don't know if you're a he or she, that's not. Um, and we had this, we know that we can echo now, um, something like, you know that we can echo, um, echo things like this. Um, and let's, um, let's look what happens if I just go name is, and without putting a dot in here, without putting a dot in here, let's run the program and see what happens. It, it gets very, con the, the interpreter gets confused by this expression. We've got a string and then a variable, and we want to merge those two together. And that's what a red dot does. The red dot allows us to concatenate two different expressions. Often it's a string with another string, but it could also be a string with a number. So with an integer, I think. I think this will work. Or oh, maybe it won't. Let me, I don't know if this works in PHP. Let's find out. Yeah, it does. So the dot merges these two expressions together so that when echo goes to you to put the information into the um into the uh into the terminal window um it merges the expressions before it does so if i remove these red dots we've actually got three separate expressions there and the interpreter gets horribly confused if i run it now it says syntax error unexpected variable unexpected value name so it, it, it's got three values here when it only wants one. So if I put a dot in here, I merge all of these expressions into one expression. And so then when I, then when I run it, it merges them together. So that's, that's the function of the red dots. It, it merges 
expressions and lets us echo them at once. Yeah, concatenation, as um, user Ilias has said. Um, do I have an example of pulling data from an EMR to populate patient value fields, such as the height and weight you've shown? I know there's a lot of regulation surrounding access to patient data, but there must be a, some um, alternative data use cases that are less HIPPA sensitive. Yeah. Oh, Sean, hey, you're from Twitter. Um, welcome. Um, so there's some, there you are absolutely right about some um, uh, real ethical issues here. Um, regarding um, access to medical information. And so I'm very hesitant to kind of, um, uh, you know, um, to encourage that everyone just sort of goes and does this, you know, always check with your um, hospital uh, ethics committee or their IT governance committee before you try and do anything that accesses an EMR. Um, what was the second part of the question? I know there's a lot of regulations. Um, yeah, so um, in terms of examples, I note that um, I think from memory, you're either a medical student or a doctor, Sean. Um, uh, you, you might be familiar with the concept of a department audit. So an audit where, you know, let's say it's an orthopedic surgery department. They might look at all of the, you know, the knee replacements they've done in the last 12 years or 12 months rather, and, you know, um, want to look at, um, the weights of the patients and compare that with their length of stay. So how long they stayed in hospital, maybe to look at um, uh, uh, how, um, um, you know, how, how weight affects how long someone stays in hospital. Um, in this day and age, most people do that manually. So they go, they tr literally trawl through like a web interface that has their patient data on it. And, um, uh, um, and manually enter that stuff into like an Excel spreadsheet and then start running data on it and stuff, uh, start running data and our analysis on it. Um, in my personal opinion, if I can manually access data in that way, um, I'm allowed to access it. And therefore I don't really believe that the manner in which I access it should matter. Um, obviously there are some caveats to that, you know, because automatically accessing data would let you do it at a higher scale and, you know, with potential for issues and stuff like that. Um, I maybe in the next session, Sean, maybe that's something we could work the example on is actually how to access an EMR and like pull data from it and put it into a program. That's probably a little bit beyond the scope of today's session. Um, but maybe you want to DM me or, or maybe in the next session we can do that. Maybe that's the thing that we'll work on is how to do something like that, pull data from a website um, and put it into a, um, into a program and then store it in an Excel spreadsheet as an example. Um, but if you, if you want to get into that, Sean, some stuff you should look into, like if you're using PHP, that, that kind of con, assuming you've got a, um, a web interface to interact with, you're looking that, that, that type of thing is called web scraping, like loading a website, website and pulling information out of it. That's called web scraping. So that's something that I would look into. Um, if you don't have a web interface to interact with for your EMR, if it's some other, um, like desktop application, there are ways that you can pull data out of that um, using something like Python, which is really good for automation. Um, but uh, yeah, probably a little bit beyond the scope of today's stuff. Um, so Rodrigo is asking me, why does the terminal, terminal show the answer of the if statement when is a younger patient and not the answer of the BMI equation? Okay, so I'm assuming you are referring to, can we go back to something like, um, here. So he's asking um, why terminal shows the answer of the if statement when it's a younger patient and not the answer of the BMI equation. Ah, okay. So um, let's just see if this runs hopefully. Uh, So we've, we've, here we've set up an if and an else statement. So when we have um, an age of 16, um, um, I, I think what you're asking, Rodrigo, is why is it only showing this, this, this state, um, expression here and not this expression? I think that's what you're asking. The reason for that is that in this example, the age is 16, so this expression is 
um, true because 16 is less than 18. And therefore this code block is running and this code block is being skipped because we're using an else statement. That's what an else statement does. Recall that an, um, if we just had this, um, if I got rid of this else statement and just put this back on the same plane as the other stuff, this would run the if statement, which would be true, and therefore run this code block, and then continue in the program and calculate the BMI and echo it. So let's see what happens if I run it now. You can see that it's given that expression and it's output the BMI. We don't want that though. In this case, we're gonna use an else statement. So this else code block will only run in the case that this code block gets skipped. So if I pop that in here, Um, you can see that we no longer echo the BMI because this expression is true, which means this code block runs and this code block is skipped. If I change this to, um, so, that, so that this expression is now false, this code block is skipped and this code block will run, giving us our BMI. Um, I think in future sessions, I will definitely try to do a better job of answering the questions as we go, because I, I know going back and answering questions is not necessarily that useful. Um, I knew my HTML skills would, from making my MySpace page would come in handy. That's actually like one of my earliest exposures to HTML was MySpace as well, making layouts and stuff. Um, all right, and it looks like Chloe's uploaded the um, YouTube video, which is awesome. Um, and Yumna Hassanan is asking me, do I think Python is important and useful in medical engineering? 100 out of 10, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. What, one of the best languages to start with. Um, Rodrigo is asking me um, if I use the CSS code, um, kind of, yeah. The, I didn't really use a true CSS, like a true style sheet, but this is kind of a shorthand way of, of writing CSS. So these are all, these are all um, style, style on this. All right. How is Python useful in medicine? Um, so, you know, I, I touched on this a little bit um, on the, in the last session. Um, Python's really good for things like um, data analysis, automation, and um, even um, uh, there was one other example I had last session. Yeah, like um, machine learning type stuff. Um, uh, um, and so, you know, when you say it's useful in medicine, you know, it's not useful in medicine in the sense that you're going to be writing Python scripts on your ward round. But I think as an additional skill that you can use um, to go along with your medicine, you can make little tools and stuff like that that are the high, highly useful. So, um, yeah, um, feel free to DM me if you want to talk more about like what that can actually do for you. If you've got some basic Python skills or basic programming skills, I could help you find some like projects that would be at your skill level and pretty useful and something to show off sort of thing. Um, so Ciara Irwin is asking me, um, how can I see my HTML code on my browser when I'm making it? Sorry, this is a very daft question. However, I just cannot get it to work on Chrome. Um, I'm on a Windows laptop. Um, okay, so the absolute quickest way if you're doing nothing, because setting up, so what you need to do is set up a development environment, um, which is a little bit of a drag. It kind of sucks that beginners have to do this first. It's a little bit hard, it's not hard to do, it's just fairly involved. So what I'd recommend to start with is go to somewhere like Khan Academy or any of those online websites. They have a kind of a built-in interpreter in there. Let's go, um, what's it called? Khan Academy HTML course. Um, um, and basically in these web pages they have a they, they've built a very sophisticated web page that lets you like write html in their um in their in their environment and so you don't have to set anything up um if you do want to write yeah w3 schools is another great website really really good website has, that can let you like play with html and stuff like that without having to set something up um, yeah, I won't keep loading this, but um, if you do want to set it up on your, on your own machine, I don't know if you can see this here. This is a thing. This is um, one of the one of the simpler ways to set up a development environment, um, and this um, it's called um, XAMPP. I think that's how you say it. It stands for um, uh, 
cross-platform Apache, MySQL, PHP, um, and Perl. Don't worry about that. Basically what this is, it's a little um, uh, tool that kind of tricks your computer to thinking it's on the internet. Um, it's, it's basically like a little server that you install on your computer and that processes the HTML for you and, and prints it and stuff like that. Um, again, maybe in a future session, we'll talk about how to set up your development environment. As a very beginning, uh, as a beginner, I think doing something like this, this is the Khan Academy thing where you can put your HTML here and I'm assuming if I hit go, it will like appear here, does it? I don't know. Welcome to Yeah, anyway. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a quick way to get started. But in, to answer your question directly, um, Ciara, you need to install something like XAMP. Um, and then once you've installed XAMP, you turn it on and you hit, oh, it's just crashed, I think. Um, you hit go on this little web server. Um, and then as of that, once you've done that, you can um, send requests to um, your own files and they'll appear in Chrome and stuff like that. So that's how it's done. Um, yeah, all right. Um, I'll probably leave it there unless there are any other questions. Um, thank you very much for joining today and persisting um, through all of this. I really appreciate it. Um, are there more questions? I was thinking about trying to learn JavaScript. The only idea I'm familiar with it, um, what is HTML and statistics. Is this a good idea? Uh, so you can learn JavaScript. JavaScript is a really, really powerful language. I don't love it. Um, few of the like, intricacies of the language kind of annoy me, but you can do really, really powerful stuff with it. It's modern, um, really, really rich community, like lots of really, really good developers building really cool stuff that you can like repurpose for your own projects. Um, yeah, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript will go together really, really well, um, really, really, really well. Um, and you can look at, um, once you've learned the basics of JavaScript, you could go and learn something like React, which I, I don't use React. But um, it's a, um, a, a really powerful like UI um, framework. So you could look into React, which is a JavaScript framework. Um, Rodrigo, if you're interested in learning a bit more about that. <clears throat> thanks, Will. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Josh, again. And a special, a special thanks for waking up so early. Uh, we will upload the, 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 today's webinar and the previous webinar by Monday. And this brings us to the end of the session. Thank you everyone for joining. Thanks guys.